Today's Animal Spirits is brought to you by the Texas Small Cap Equity Index ETF, ticker TXSS. Look, I was looking at this the other day, the biggest economies in the world, and they had them all listed by GDP. And you could put two states in there if you wanted to from the United States. California is the biggest. So I think California is like the sixth biggest GDP in the world. Wow. If it was its own country. Texas is in the top 10 of economies worldwide. Everything is bigger in Texas. Yes. Although they've got a... They've got a hole in Dallas in the running back position. Did they sign anybody yet? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe Derrick Henry? Everything bigger? That's true. Uh, so more public companies are based in Texas than any other state. I didn't know that. Hmm. Uh, so Texas Capital, Texas Small Cap Equity Index ETF, uh, trades on the NASDAQ, uh, gives you access to small cap companies headquartered in Texas. I would invest in Riggins Rigs if I could. You're What's- not a Friday Night Lights fans? <laughs> uh, but no. Ri- Never Riggins it. Riggs from Friday Night Lights. What type of company uh, is that? <laughs> Tim Riggins was the the running back in the show, and him and his brother started a co- uh, company called Riggins Riggs. Still around? I don't know. Uh, to learn more about TXSS, visit our website or hit the link provided in the description of the show notes. Investors should carefully consider the investment objectives, risks, and charges of the fund before investing. The prospectus contains this information and other information about the fund, and it should be read carefully before investing. Investors can obtain a copy of the prospectus by calling 844-822-3837. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. The Texas Equity Index ETF is distributed by Northern Light Distributors, LLC. Member FINRA SIPC, which is not affiliated with Texas Capital Bank Private Wealth Advisors. Welcome to Animal Spirits with Michael and Ben. I have exciting news. We've got a Los Angeles office now. Now, we speak with a lot of advisors, and I always say I'm geographically agnostic. We just want the best people. I don't care where they are. I'm not going to name locations, but I don't care where they are. Really, it truly doesn't matter. We're a virtual company. Eh, not virtual, but we have people yes. all, everywhere. Doesn't... We're made up of coastal elites and flyover state people like me. We've got a great mix. Um, so we are, but it's nice to have somebody in Los Angeles finding, not, not just one person, two people, incredible planners, and we're coming to see them. We're coming out. We're posting up. Uh, if you are in the Los Angeles area and you're wondering about how we help clients in our day job with tax management, estate planning, obviously investments, Now's your chance. On April 29th and April 30th, I will be in Los Angeles with a lot of members of my team. If you're interested in reaching out, hit us up at info at redholtswealth.com with the subject line Los Angeles to set up a time to meet. One more thing, advisors, we are, like I said, we got two people there, but we're just getting started. Uh, We have plans. There are so many producers of shitty horror movies that you've mentioned that should be clients. Tons. Right? If you if you've directed anything that's dark, wicked, or evil, <laughs> I want to meet with you. Uh, oh, one more thing, Josh and I are doing a live Compound and Friends episode. We haven't announced the the venue or the speakers, but let's just say I'm excited. It's gonna be good. It's gonna be grand. And last thing, we're going to be where are we gonna be? If you want to come see us, we're gonna be in the West Hollywood area. We've got a great venue, very nice. I don't know if chic is the right word. I'm not really quite sure what that means, but it's a nice spot. Okay. All right, Ben, let's get to it. What's going on? I looked at this the other day. We've hit something like 16 or 17 new all-time highs in the S&P already this year, which seems like a lot considering March isn't even over yet. So I looked at this. 35% of all trading days this year have been an all-time high. Hmm. I tweeted this out. I said, that that seems high to me, 35%. I think historically the number is like 7% of all-time highs uh, on trading days since 1950. So any trading day, 7 or 8% of the time, it's an all-time high. 35% seems high. Jason Gepfert, who we've talked about on the show many times, at sentiment trader, said it is. It's the fourth most ever. So we went back to 1929, and this has happened in the 60s and the 80s and the 90s. I'm actually surprised. So he's saying to start the year, this is the fourth highest ever, like percentage of days. I'm surprised that there was p- times when it was that much higher. So 30, 46% in like 1963. It's a good year. It's a good year. I guess so. Ben, last but, week I was like uh, sort of wondering why, uh, without reason that I can come up with, the S&P is just melting higher. Um, I think the, the data point that we threw out last week was like 16 of 18 weeks. It's higher. That hasn't happened since 1970. I saw a tweet this morning, Bank of America. I think Bank of America is raising their earnings per share estimates for the year. And maybe that's one reason. 
is that things are fundamentals are still improving. I, I know it's sort of maybe I'm reaching here, but I don't know. Still don't know. Everything is still. Carl Cantini tweeted this out this morning. This is from Delta. Delta Airlines CEO says nine of the pa- nine of the best ten sales days in the company's history have occurred within the last ten weeks. Remember when people were long worried the stock, that long the stock. Are you really? Yeah. Okay. I've been there for a while. You held out longer than Buffett, I guess. Remember when people said that like air travel is going to be impacted forever because we're not going to have any business travelers because people are going to be working from home and you're not going to have as many business trips. Seemed sensible at the time. I was saying that. We we get we get updates from people who go to who travel because they they want to tell us about the, the resort they went to in the Keys or and we always get I love it when people send us pictures of their Miami Vice when they're on the on the road because they try them. But a, a few people in the last couple of weeks have said, "Listen, the only signal I need about the economy is traveling because they're like everywhere you go, the airports are packed, the the restaurants are packed, the resorts are packed." I know that that's an anecdotal thing, but if, if you do travel, it's not you really can't anecdotal. Around. I mean, Delta, what Delta just said, that's not anecdotes. That's, that's but data. You can't, if you go travel somewhere, where, wherever you're going or in, on any kind of trip, you can't look around and see the, how packed the travel, everything is and think like, oh, people are slowing down their spending. No. It just hasn't slowed down at all. So back to the market, the Kobeisi letter, how, how would you pronounce that? Kobayashi? <laughs> I mean, I want to say Kobayashi, but I don't see a, 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 all right, let's go with it. Um, All right, current market mentality. NVIDIA stock is up, S&P 500 goes to new all-time high. NVIDIA stock is flat, S&P 500 goes to new all-time high. NVIDIA stock is down, S&P 500 falls thirty just 30 points. Yesterday, NVIDIA marked its largest percentage drop since May 31st. This was uh, tweeted on March 9th, which I guess was Friday. Uh, it also marked the single largest loss of market cap in a day for NVIDIA at $128 billion, yet the S&P 500 fell just 30 points after a 27% run in four months. Uh, is this the most resilient market of all time? Now, so the point, I don't the know about point that, but that we, it's, 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 uh, it's impressive. The point is that we have this huge company, and people are like, well, the huge company is underperformed, the stock market's going to fall, and it hasn't happened yet. You you mentioned, I think, on Slack the other day, you said something about, what did you? What was your line about hated bull markets? Me? You, you yeah, I, I'm not. A, I those words don't come out of my mouth very often. So, no, you were comment. Someone else ta- commented about most. Let me pull it up here. That's not a me thing. Okay, you said when people say oh. this feels like one of the most hated rallies of all time. Wait, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Sean posted this. It was somebody else saying the most hated bull ro- bull market because I. Yes. Don't, all right, so go ahead. So with that context, go so ahead. So someone else said something about this being one of the hated bull, bull, most hated bull markets of all time. You said when they say the most hated bull markets of all time, what they mean is I hate this bull market. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. <laughs> Which is pretty good, but I just don't think that you can use these contrarian sentiment indicators anymore. People trying to do magazine indicators and flows and I just I think it's all I don't think there's any good indicators like that anymore. So you had who was the guy you guys had on TCAF last week? Todd with all the, so he was talking you guys are talking about how money markets are like the, the greatest fund ever for flows. Yeah. Like that, money that market funds. That makes sense, I so, guess. You could look at any, you could look right now and say, geez, there's all this money going into Bitcoin ETFs and crypto, and that this is crazy speculative. But then you could look on the other side and go, wait, there's trillions of dollars going into money market funds. That that sounds conservative. So I feel like you could pick anything right now and make it, spin it to your, your narrative. But the, I think the point is, everyone just has a lot of money. People are very, people who have money and wealth right now have tons of options and they're putting their money into everything. Yeah, Americans are very rich. We're going to talk about that later in the show. Um, all right, great chart from... I've seen these charts before. It's a combination of EPFR, Haver Analytics, and Deutsche Bank Asset Allocation. Is this a Deutsche Bank actual chart? Who's producing this I'm, chart? I'm guessing. Okay. And what we're looking at is... This si- looks like it came... Don't, don't you think all wealth management or bank big financial firms have similar looking charts? You can just kind of tell if it comes from a bank. I guess uh, Deutsche Bank asset allocation should should be the tell. Yeah, that's from the bank. All right, sector fund flows. Cumulative sector, global sector fund flows. And it's telecom, which has taken in around $60 billion or so. And everything else is negative except for a little bit of money went into telecom and industrials look flat. But money's coming out of everything else. Technology is it, right? Remember when technology stocks were dead for like 15 months? They were. Not only were they dead, they were buried. <laughs> Uh, really, I wrote a post really about like index fund flows and how they're impacting the market. Uh, when, when people talk about index fund flows, I think they're talking about the S&P 500, but what about sector fund flows? Those are index funds. Is, is that, should that be lumped in? I, 
I suppose. Yeah, that's true. I, I think people look at those as more niche, but good point. But they are indexes and they're market cap weighted. Yeah. For the most part. Um, this was, I don't know if this is interesting or, or, or what. Um, so in, NVIDIA had a pretty gnarly reversal last week. Let's see if there's any follow through. Maybe there will be, maybe there won't be. Tech had, this is Bank of America, tech had the largest outflow on a single week ever. However, these charts need to be adjusted for, for market cap, right? Because in terms of just absolute dollars, yes, it was, it was, pretty, uh, it was pretty hefty. But if you look, if you normalize that for a percentage of market cap, I don't know if right, that's- The dollars are bigger now. Yeah, exactly. Way bigger. The market's bigger. Yes, I agree. Yes. It, it looks like an outlier, but it's relative to the market. It's not that big of a deal. Then last week when we were talking about, um, like, I can't believe that we're back. We're doing the sh same shit in terms of like uh, the meme coin mania. And it, it's different than 2021. It's not quite as insane. It's not literally everything. Like there's a lot of high beta stuff that is definitely not participating this time around. Uh, but we've spent a lot of time over the years talking about valuation and long-term valuation and long-term return expectations. So the valuation composite for the S&P 500, and this is a combination of price to earnings, forward PE, price to book, price to sales, and inverted dividend yield. This comes from uh, Belsky's group at BMO. 2021 was super expensive, right? Like we knew it at the time and valuations came way in as stock prices did. But now we're back off to the races. Now we're not quite at 2021 highs, but we're not far away either. Like we're doing it again, huh? For valuations? I remember at the time, the, it, it, it almost made more sense back then because rates were so low. When rates were at zero, it made sense for valuations to be so much higher. You can't make the same argument this time. It's it's surprising this is happening with rates at 5%. It is surprising. We also got the ROE pulled back, which is obviously a big driver of returns. And now that's not all the way recovered, but halfway recovered. I, I really, I keep thinking about that article that we spoke about last week where this guy was talking about, I think uh, this is Zach Morris Substack, where he was talking about the monetary pro the monetary premium and why valuations may be higher today. Uh, I really think there's something there. Like I know Josh outlined that in the relentless bid, but to call it a monetary premium in, in terms of how people are saving and, and investing, I think mean, I think that's I think that's uh, I think there's a there there. The only pushback we got on this, which I thought was a fair point, is why hasn't this happened in other countries then? That's a good point. I don't know the extent to which other countries are encouraging individuals to contribute to retirement accounts. There, there, well, we talk about this with small business activity. How Remember how you have to be delusional to start a business in the US but because so many of them fail, but we still do it all the time and it's never been higher. I do think there's something about this country. I think it's a cultural thing or whatever that in this country, that the stock market means a lot. The economy means a lot. Starting a business means a lot. I think it means something more here than it does in other countries. If you right ask the average the average person on the street, do you think, well, I don't know if they don't even know how to answer this question, but let's just say people that are investing in 401k, do you think that the market is going to be higher in 10 years? I think everyone says yes. Whereas in other countries, that's probably, you probably get a different answer. Isn't that the best, the same thing for housing prices though. I know like, you get worried about the short term, but do you think housing prices are going to be lower in 10 years than they are now? <laughs> no. Right? Can, is, <laughs> that's, if you're buying a house today, are you going to get those same returns that we've gotten in the last four or five years? Of course not. But do you really think housing prices, if you sit in a house for 10 years, that is going to be lower? Maybe, but odds are probably that it's going to be higher. All right. My, one of my favorite annual updates, the Credit Suisse Global Investment Yearbook. You look at this one yet? Mm -mm. Okay. So I, they, they've always had the chart that shows the U.S. made up like 15% of global market cap in 1900. And then it now makes up like 60 something percent. So, but they actually showed how this changes over time. And the, I think the most interesting part about this is the Japan thing in 1990. So the U.S. went from, you know, really pretty high number in the 60s and 70s, and Japan ate into the U.S. a lot, where it went from like 60, 70% down to 30% again. And then we kind of digested that, and the U.S. is going back to where it was in the 60s and 70s. Now, it's still lower than it was in the 60s and 70s, actually, which is surprising. Japan is so back. Nikkei had a new all-time high, first time since 1989. Shogun, Tokyo Vice. Have they ever been more back? I got back, back into Tokyo Vice last night. 
I'm, I still haven't watched it yet. I'm not sure what I'm waiting for. I'm just, I've got a lot of, a lot of things in my queue. Took me a minute. Do you ever have shows where you really, really need the recap? Like I, I loved the first season. I needed that five minute recap to bring me back into like what's going on. Sometimes yeah. I have too many shows in my head. Sometimes it's hard to remember what happened. I feel okay, like here, here's another good one. We worry about stock market concentration here. Look at what the sector weights were for the United States and the UK in 1900. Rail stocks made up like two thirds of the US stock market in 1900. Like today, today's stock market is more, way more diversified than it was in the past. Mm -hmm. I think, remember, you read the, uh, the ben Intelligent Investor, right? Like people always talk about the margin of safety stuff and Mr. Market. What is it? I think it's chapters eight and 20. If you just wanted to read those two chapters, you'd probably be fine. But if you read the rest of that book, he talks about like railroad stocks for most of it. Yeah. It the rest seems of the book so is foreign. borderline unreadable. Actually, a lot of it is. But the point is that a, a lot of this, the stock market has always been concentrated like this. So a period where we went through where it wasn't that concentrated, that is, that, that's actually outside the norm. All right, Morningstar did a top 15 wealth destroying funds over the past 10 years. Most of them are these ultra short, whatever. The ultra short QQQ has lost $8.5 billion of, of assets, which is kind of crazy. And it still has $3.5 billion in it. I guess that's just total trading volatility decay. Uh, so most of them, but the number three is, is ARC, Innovation Fund. It's lost an estimated $7.1 billion. And we talked about this at the time because so much of the money went in after the performance was good. And this fund hasn't really played catch up at all with the tech stuff coming back. Mm -mm. ARC is still in a 67% drawdown. So this is the non-profitable tech index, basically, right? Goldman has one. So that, yeah, that's, that is not, that is not participating in the, in the recent rally. That's surprising. Now, is this because that segment of the market is not working or is it because ARC moves stuff around a little bit and they just positioned wrong and they missed everything? No, 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 no. Well, perhaps there's some of that, but there's still very little appetite. If you look at all of these stocks, now they're, they're not one group per se, but the market still has very little appetite for these money losing companies. So that's different, way different than 2021. Okay, it's just, it's, it's surprising. If you would have said, this, we're gonna have all this speculation again, and ARC is still gonna be lagging big time. It's, it, it's surprising. All right, did you ever figure out how to read this Cliff Asnes interview I sent you? No, I'm a little bit okay. disappointed. I pay for the FT, but this was, like a, this was like a, I don't pay for the premium one. I guess I just pay for the basic one. I couldn't get yeah, into I this. Always, I Google the headline, and then I, you get like one free somehow. I, I don't know. I couldn't, I couldn't get in. You know what the worst part about the FT is? If we're when you, copy, when you copy and paste and it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Why do they do that? They want. It gives you this big want, long thing about preamble about not stealing their stuff or what? What don't you want people to share your stuff? They want credit. You could share it, but they want credit. So Cliff Asnes was on there and I got a couple of sound bites of his about AI, but he, they did an interview with him and, and I, I'm a big Asnes fan and he's talking about value and they're asking him about being invested in a strategy that's underperforming. And I think the, the problem with the markets is there's. I don't know, three different time horizons. Because you have your short-term market cycles that is just all over the place. But then you have your, like, your intermediate-term cycles where something is going to outperform for five, seven, 10, maybe even 15 years. And then you have the long-term, which is fundamentals. And so Asnes was talking about how like basically you have no other choice but to diversify because no one knows the future. He says, so you allocate what you think is the right amount of risk of things because the secret is the whole stock market is just as susceptible to like over and under performance. Maybe the most interesting example is the U.S. versus non-U.S. developed stocks. Famously, the U.S. had crushed everything in the past 15 years. During the 15 years prior to that, it was why invest in the U.S. And I think people forgot about this. When I, we were coming out of the great financial crisis, and, and as this just says, like in 1990s, the U.S. was cheaper than the world. Like everything else was more expensive because of Japan. And now he's saying U.S. is more expensive than the world. But he's saying almost all of the U.S.'s victory was from richening. You can argue that it's justified. What's from what? Richening, like valuations. Uh oh. Richening. He says you can wow. you can argue if it's justified, but you tend not to get a repeat, another 30 year relative tripling of the valuation ratio. I tell any US investor with some international diversification, you're doing the right thing. It's just the time scales these things work on. And I don't think people realize in coming out of 2009, 2010, every single pitch I saw was emerging markets in BRICS, and that's where the growth is, and the US is gonna be fading because of the Great Depression. Yeah, br recession. BRICS back then was private credit today. 
Yeah, so it, it is crazy that the U.S. has outperformed international for 15 years. That's It's probably the longest, it's not, not the long, biggest magnitude of underperformance, but it's the longest stretch of this kind of cycle. But I don't think people realize how cyclical this stuff really is. It's just on a time horizon like this, you you think like, okay, that it's it's changed forever. Mm. And it, maybe it has, but I, I wouldn't want to make that bet that, okay, that's it. It's changed forever, and but the U.S. is going to continue to keep getting richer is, and richer. But maybe it has, but it's but we can't rule that out. That's what makes us hard. Yes, and at Tazis's point, he says no one knows the future. But I, I think I would rather make the diversification bet than the concentration bet. Totally. That, that's my, that's my stance. I'm with you on that. Okay. This is surprising. Uh, I sent this to you last week. So GLD, gold hit a all-time, new all-time high last week, which had zero fanfare, I think. Yeah. Did it seem like maybe one headline? I, I didn't see anyone really discussing it. But the... As gold is hitting a new all-time high for the first time in a while, GLD's assets are down one-third from the peak in 2020. Very I forgot how much money went in in 2020, but this isn't happening with a ton of money flowing into to gold. So has, has Bitcoin really taken some of the shine off here, pun intended? Yes. It has to, right? Yeah. It's, it just That surprised me that that number wasn't screaming higher. And it wasn't just like money's going to a different fund. The same was true of IAU, whatever that, the other one is. Hmm. It's just kind of surprising. All right, Ben, did you see this video of a guy who just got back from the grocery store and was very upset with the price of the groceries? I think that's just the way I, I didn't watch this particular one, but that's the way you go. I know people are complaining about their five guys receipts. In well, let me King. just re- let me read some quotes. I just got back from the grocery store. Am I the only one that feels like they just can't do it anymore? I bought the cheapest stuff. That's this is all I purchased. That's it. Take a guess at what it costs, and you're probably wrong. $123 with all my discounts for barely two nights of dinner. Um, this, I don't know if we est- underestimated. Uh, rising prices is just so psychologically damaging. Well, you and I used to talk about the grocery store thing before inflation was even high. We talked about that like in 2019, people would talk about grocery store stuff. Yeah. And and even though like, let's just assume that this person's real income is flat, which maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, it doesn't matter. Now it matters in the sense that, can you imagine if income hadn't kept up with inflation? Can you imagine how upset people would be then? Well, if income but, hadn't kept up with inflation, we would be in like a huge recession already. Yeah, that's true. That's, that's true. So when I say, when I, all right. So, but so this is, this is what's getting people upset because we spoke about this before. You adjust to your income, right? You deserve it. But the price increases are unfair. And the problem with stuff like the grocery store, it's, it's the bare minimum. These are necessities. You're not choosing to splurge. You have to feed your family. And when you go to the grocery store every week and the prices just keep going higher and higher, th- this, this is it. This is the whole kit and caboodle. This is why people are pissed off. Yeah, I get it. It just I- destroys people's sanity. And I totally get it. I get it too, because it, 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 the, it's the stuff that you see the most often. Yeah, if you bought groceries once every six months. It's you wouldn't the complain as much. basic necessities. It's not like these people are like. It's not like this guy's like, man, I just took such an expensive. Uh, can you believe how much this flight costs to the Caribbean? Like these are the basic necessities. I I also I, I'm not trying to like poo poo this story. I get it. I got some bananas today. I sometimes I don't I don't understand understand how st- some things are still so cheap. I got like ten bananas and it was like. Two dollars and fifty cents. So you're how Ben that, Carlson how says. Th- ben Carlson says, "Stop complaining and eat bananas." Listen, if I was <laughs> if I was on a tight budget, all I would eat is eggs and bananas because they're so cheap. Um, but and I, I but don't you buy ever buy like a box of pencils or something and, and think the the amount of time it takes to produce this and pack it and ship it and they still sell it anyway. Sorry, I don't mean to poo-poo the inflation thing. Food share, of, food spending share of disposable income has hit a three-decade high. Yeah, especially, yeah, it's expensive. Um, but it's still, remember we talked about this a couple weeks ago, it's still way, way lower than it was. So look at this, 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 is, kind of a, this is kind of a chart crime. because Which part? They, the axis, it's an axis misdemeanor. So they show the axis, it's, it's from 11 to 10%, basically. It's, it's a little higher, but it no, went there's from. Not a char- there's not a chart crime. It's showing exactly what it is. It's, it's at a three decade Start high. the axis at zero. You can't start it at nine to 12. That, that's a chart crime. And that's not a chart crime. If you started the axis at zero, you wouldn't be able to see anything. Exactly. That's the point. It's not, it's, it looks like a way bigger increase than it is. 
no, in this number? No, the truth is it's at a three decade high. And this is the way to show it. And the truth, the truth is also, this number was way, way higher in the 60s, 70s, 50s, 40s, 30s. What? Food made up like 40% of people's budget, and now it's 11. Yeah, but that has nothing to do with anything. Why? Because people weren't, people that are alive today, this guy wasn't, wasn't buying groceries in the 60s. And also the thing is, this thing crashed in 2020 because prices fell. So, so going from that low base to the high base, now, yes, it's increased, but it's not that much higher than it was pre-2020. Doesn't, but none of these things matter. Whether yeah. it's a chart crime or what doesn't matter because people feel how data they Data doesn't matter? I'm sorry, it no, does. No, data, data doesn't always matter. Data doesn't, data does not supersede people's feelings. You, if you show this chart to a guy, you think he's going to punch you in the face because I think he's going to punch you in the face. Okay. See, you're talking about individuals and anecdotes. I'm talking about the whole economy. But individuals make up the economy. And a lot of people feel this way. Uh, see, this is you falling prey to the internet, though. You see one viral video and you go, okay, that's it. He's right. You think this, you think this is the only guy? I'm not saying, listen, the economy is made up of hundreds of millions of people. There's always going to be this side, this side, this side, like that's what makes an economy. But everyone's on this side. Everyone is paying a three decade high for, not everyone. A lot of people are doing this. God, it, it's, yes, it's true. The grocery store prices are higher. Uh, but it's not as bad as this story makes it out to be. Redfin reports asking runs climb 2% in February, biggest gain in over a year. So we got data today for uh, CPI came out. Inflation's not going, hasn't, uh, it's not going down anymore. Yeah, th no, this is, if we're arguing about decimal points, we've already won the game. If inflation is 3.1 instead of 3.0, we, it's, we've won, okay? It's over. I don't know if it's over. The, the worst of the bad stuff, it's over. The Fed's going to cut in June. Michael the McDonough, thing, Michael McDonough tweeted, is, Michael McDonough tweeted, an increase in segment of the U.S. CPI index is growing at an annualized rate exceeding 4%. In fact, subcomponents constituting over 63% of the total CPI index are climbing at a rate faster than 4%. It's not over. I don't think it's over. I'm not saying it's, it's go back to seven, but it's not, it's not over. If it's 3.1 versus 3.2 or 3.0, like, is that, I'm sorry, we're splitting hairs here. It's over. It's back to the long-term average. Those prices are still there, but it's over. So what the Fed's going to cut in June, and the only thing that matters is if it stays a little elevated and doesn't go back to the twos, how many times is the Fed cut? I think that's where we're arguing about here. You really think inflation is over? It's still the bad. It's, the, the worst part of it, it's over. Yes, the worst part of inflation is over. Now, if the economy remains strong, then it, yeah, if it reaccelerates, that I'm I, I'm debating whether that's a problem or not. If the economy continues to remain strong and inflation stays higher, is that a is that better than the alternative of the economy faltering and inflation falling? Is that better? But the, the, the nasty inflation, we're worried about the 70s, that stuff's over. Get well, it out of your system. I, I mean, yes, inflation's not at 7% anymore. But to say it's over, I don't know. I guess we disagree on that one. Okay. Uh, 25 months straight with unemployment rate below 4%, which is the longest streak since the 1960s. We're never going to see a labor market this strong again. So I think maybe that would be the thing. But it's also ticking up a little bit, like very, very slowly. And I think that's something that could worry people. I think the, so the best argument for, we've talked about people having a lot of money. The best argument for the Fed cutting rates here, I think is this, Logan Motoshami, new listings data this week. In 2011, there was 362,000 homes that were newly listed for sale. Of course, that was during a- Why do you choose 2011? Uh, I, I don't know, just making a comparison. Okay. 2024, 59,000. Wow. This to me is, and Powell finally mentioned it on his press conference last week. This is the reason the Fed needs to cut rates, is the housing market. But I think, I think what they could do, if they really wanted mortgage rates to fall, because if you look at, the, I put this in your U.S. existing home sales. Last year, it was the last 12 months of 2023 was 4 million. The average is like 5.3 usually. So there were still houses being transacted and sold. Dead right we were now. just talking, we're like one and a half million below the average. But- why wouldn't the Fed say, listen, we want the spread between the two, because the 10 years at 4% and mortgage rates are still at seven, which is really high for the long-term average spread. Why couldn't the Fed just say, listen, we want the spread between treasuries and mortgage rates to come down. 
and we're willing to step in there if we need to. Don't you think mortgage rates would fall immediately if they said that? All what, they need to do is t talk about it. What if the Fed doesn't cut but starts buying mortgage bonds again? I, that, that's what I'm saying. Like, what if, if they really, if they think the housing market is, because that's a big part of the economy. And if, if people aren't buying and the economy is less dynamic because people aren't moving because they're stuck or they can't afford something, that, that's, a, that's a real problem for the economy. I think the Fed's finally realizing that. Yeah, I agree. My opinion is with financial conditions so loose and inflation still, in my opinion, on the high side, why would they cut? Inflation's not high, though. It's 3%. That's the long, long term average is three and a half percent. It's not high. But you're fine. gonna have to come around to my eye. You're gonna have to come around on this one. Three percent inflation is not high. It's literally the average. Fine. What's the argument for cutting? The housing market. That's the biggest. That's the biggest argument. And the other thing is just they're in restrictive territory. So the Fed doesn't. The Fed shouldn't care about the stock market. That's not part of their mandate. The the Fed should care that unemployment rate is slowly ticking up. And the housing market is stopped dead in its tracks. But with financial conditions this loose and they cut, I get that they shouldn't care about the market, but isn't there a risk that they cut prematurely and we overheat again and inflation really picks up? Well, that's the, that's the thing people are debating now, though. Okay, the Fed's going to probably cut in June. Maybe before they were going to cut six times this year. Maybe now they only cut two or three. I think that that's the debate now. That they just don't cut as much as they thought. And then maybe people start really thinking that. And that, that's their signal to the market. Like, we're not going to go as easy as you thought. Just given cut. how strong the economy, you know, ex-housing remains, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a central banker, but I see no reason to cut. Because there's no reason to be in restrictive territory like this if the inflation rate is this low and rates are but this high. But is it restrictive? It's, it's not, it's, what is it slowing down other than the housing market? Which is 20% of the economy. 20% of economic activity is the housing market. That's a huge piece of the yeah. economy. I think that's the biggest argument that, that you could make for... And again, they don't want to overstay their welcome and push us into a recession unnecessarily. Why stay restricted? Because eventually those restrictive rates are going to cause an impact. They don't do it at 16 months, but at 17 months, it's coming. Here's a headline. This is a Hall of Fame Grand Rapids hedge quote right here. <laughs> Diamond says, U.S. economy booming, but recession not off the table. Now, I'm going to guess that he didn't actually say this. This is the headline, right? I'm sure I would guess I didn't, the link didn't have like an article in here. I guess it was, uh, he was speaking, but I'm, I'm pretty sure Jamie Dimon wasn't like, listen, the U.S. economy is booming, but, I, but there's still a chance of a recession, right? He probably said that like way later, like what he probably said, like, uh, the U.S. economy is booming. And then 20 minutes later, they asked him about a recession. And he probably said, you can't take that off the table. He has to do a Grand Rapids hedge for everything now. Cause he said a hurricane yeah. is coming. A no, my point ago. is this is, this is, this is, this is, this is headline twisting. We know how the game works. Yes. I think every financial CEO has to do a 60-40 hedge of everything. Like 60% this could be bad, 40% this could be good. But my point is, I don't even think he hedged. If I had to guess, I would say he said the economy is booming. Then later when somebody said, can you take a recession off the table? He, what if he said, yeah, you, yeah, I mean, you can't ever take it off the table. Right. True. <laughs> right? Because yes. you can't. You can't. You really <laughs> you, can't. You can't. Yeah. Uh, all right. We are, we are a very rich nation. Uh, and obviously, obviously, this is not evenly distributed. No shit. But Mike Zuccardi from Bank of America, household net worth jumped by $4.8 trillion in Q4 and is up $39 trillion since the pandemic lows. So Robert Burgess, Bob and Markets tweeted something similar. See, th see, this is, so this is back to your grocery store stuff. This is the stuff where, yes, real wages across the board haven't caught up, but, but the people who are the wealthiest can say like, ah, oh, these prices stink, but I'm also richer here. And the people who don't have that financial assets, that's, I think that's part of the reason that they're so angry too. It's like, yeah, sure. My wages have kept up a little bit, but I'm not getting richer in this other stuff either. Yeah. So this sucks. Yeah. That, that's like the argument that I totally get that how unfair it is. But that's, that's also why I don't want billionaires complaining about inflation. Like there's people who have legitimate gripes about inflation and the necessities and, and auto insurance and all this stuff. And those people do have a legitimate gripe, but there's a lot of people who are complaining who don't have that right. Yes. Um, he also, so Burgess also shows households wealth is a massive resource that easily allows the U.S. government to fund debt and deficits. So he has a chart that shows total household wealth, total public debt outstanding, and it dwarfs it. I don't know if it's four to one, but it's a massive number in terms of U.S. household assets versus the government deficit. 
He also purchased- Anyone worrying about debt in this country and thinking everyone's just credit card debt and the assets dwarf the debt so much, it's not even close. It's not even close. Uh, and then he breaks it down. Real mean net worth rose by rose to $1.8 million among 65 to 74 year olds. Uh, but it also look at the look at the monster jump for people less than 35. The 2019 real net worth was 89,000. It jumped to 184,000 just three years later. That's a 107% increase. We're never gonna see a jump that big again, I don't think. And that like a three-year period like that, right? Young people went from being totally behind their parents' generation to far above it in terms of where they were at yeah. that age, which is crazy. Again, I think there's a big difference between net worth and income, right? Like nobody celebrates their net worth because you can't spend it, right? If you've if your four hundred one k is is jacked to the you know what, that's cool, but it doesn't impact your grocery. You don't feel less bad about your grocery bill because your four hundred one k is higher. So you're saying the wealth effect is bunk? I never, I never was a big believer in the wealth effect. I really wasn't either in terms of speculating or, or I'm going to spend more money, but the data does show people, though, that savings people, rates, savings rates go down when people feel wealthier with their, with their net worth. Fair. But I think that's more of a function of the economy and less like the value of their 401k or their house. Right. I mean, I, I'm not saying it's nothing, but I, I think there's, there's greater factors at play. Um, all right, Ben. Yeah. Cause, cause for like, for me, my house is worth way more than it would have been otherwise, which is, it's, it's just crazy to think that the, the domino effect of we got a, some dude ate a bird or whatever, and people are richer now than they would be. Like my house wouldn't be worth as much as it is, and my stock portfolio wouldn't be worth as much as it is if we didn't have COVID. Fact. Which is bizarre to think about. I was watching uh, a financial advisor, Jason Pereira, did a presentation at uh, the exchange conference about AI, and there was one scene where thirty minutes into his presentation, did you watch us? No. 30 minutes into his presentation, he stopped speaking and on the screen was him speaking. And on the screen, he's like drinking a cup of water, doing a little bit of theatrics. And on the screen is his voice saying, I've been talking for 30 minutes now. I'm going to take a break. And, the, and then he fed whatever his voice to the computer. But then you saw his actual body come up on the screen and it looked exactly like him. And then it was him delivering the speech. And all of that was AI generated. And then it started, uh, Jason's hologram started talking in Japanese. Some of the AI stuff that I think a lot of people are just not playing around with uh, is going to blow people's minds very quickly. So I hopped on Mid Journey, which is sort of a pain in the butt. You have to like connect it to Discord and you have to do the prompts to Discord. I have yet to find a good website to do the generative art where I want to. Because I've tried to do no, mid, it's, it's mid, What's a mid journey? It's mid the best journey. One? Okay. It's, it's pretty, I mean, it's not hard. You have to connect it to Discord, but. Okay. So anyway, look at this, look at this image. So I typed in stock market crash on Mars. And it generates four images for you. The first one's my favorite. The guy looking sad. Scroll down. Was, so I, I, I big screened that. It's pretty good, right? That's a good one. Yeah, I like that. And then I Googled, uh, uh, Googled. <laughs> what do we call this? I mid-journeyed? I don't know. I prompted uh, two dudes podcasting on Mount Everest. Okay. Did you say one bald, one with hair? Well, I did try to, I did, I also, I didn't include this in the doc, but I, I wrote um, Michael Batnick with long blonde hair. The Sadly, my ego took a blow. Mid-journey does not know who I am. It was just so a I do dude. think that the, the tools of AI and the, and this kind of stuff and like the AI assistant, that stuff's going to be great. I don't think the information is going to be as helpful as people. So as in his interview said. But just as, as an assistant. So like we're, oh, yes. our, our podcast, our YouTube is going to eventually be broadcasting in, in other languages. That makes sense to me. Yes, that's coming. So as in his interview said, we don't think AI, at least in our field, is as revolutionary as others do. It's just statistics. It's a whole bunch of data going in and a forecast coming out. And I thought about this. Remember Google had their Gemini thing a couple weeks ago? Yes. And all the tech industry was all up in arms because they put some prompts in there where like you had to be diversified. There was had to be enough diversity in your pictures. And people got all up in arms like this is crazy. And Google's too woke. And people got really mad about it, which whatever. But Ben Thompson was talking about this. And it just made me think 
we got all this information. You have all the information humanity could possibly want in the palm of your hand now. And think and 24-7 cable news and all this stuff. And think about how many people have just had their brains rotted by this. It hasn't helped them become more informed. It's only ha- have them have more confirmation bias and you'd be even less informed. So like the AI information side of things, if AI gives someone the answer they don't want to hear, they're going to seek out another AI. So there's going to be like these political factions of AIs. People aren't going to like the information that they get. And they're mm-hmm. going to go, okay, I want another AI that gives yeah. me the, the answer I want. Mm-hmm. So I think in, informationally, like the garbage oh in, garbage God, out right. thing. There's going to be political AI. There's going to be political <laughs> And people are going, instead of finding uh, the right answer, people are going to find the answer they want to hear. Yeah, I think you're right. So I think that's the kind of thing where I don't think it's going to make us more informed. Unless the people, I mean, obviously some people use it the right way. A lot of people won't. Yeah. Um, one of our, all right, crypto, one of our listeners emailed us. They got scammed from, I think it was a phone call from Coinbase. Just a public service announcement. Be careful. Never do anything from a phone call and never click on any link in an email. That's Ben's rules of not getting scammed. The problem is like, I got a call from American Express. So somehow I, I got a text. Did you authorize this charge on Twitter? I'm like, no, but I don't know. I just assumed it was fake. And then I got a call from American Express. And again, I assumed it was fake. I called them. Turned out it was real. Okay. That's the thing. I would always call that number. Right. I would hang up and say, I'm going to call someone else yeah. in your organization. Um. All right. Eric Newcomer has a chart. So we spoke about um, how there's a little enthusiasm in gold, at least looking at the AUM. You can't say the same about crypto ETFs at all. But if you look at uh, the monthly download totals of top cryptocurrency-related apps in the United States, it is still on the floor compared to where it was in 2021. I think, understandably so, a lot of retail that got burned the last time is just out. They're just, they want no part of this. Counter to that, uh, Eric.eth on Twitter said, retail isn't here yet, like quotes. I, by the way, I love it when you read the handles of Twitter people because or uh, Bitcoin people or crypto people. It's always these random, it's like, Holder69420 says. Yeah, well, it's anyway. usually not somebody's full name. Uh, <laughs> uh, quote, retail isn't here yet. And then they said, yes, they are. They just aren't in BTC and ETH. So he shows a Google Trends chart of meme coins and yeah, that's uh, unfortunately- trying to get rich overnight. <laughs> that, would, that would vertical. So the- ETF stuff is crazy because the, the price is up more than 50% since it bottomed. I guess it's probably up, what, 70 or 80% since it bottomed at 40, whatever, when you were about to buy? No, I, no, well, I did buy at 38,000. I just, I only bought a little okay. bit. But GBTC, James uh, Safer wrote this the other day. They've had 11 billion in outflows, which is crazy since it converted into an ETF. But the AUM is still the same at 28 billion because price, appreci- price appreciation has brought it back up. Which is crazy. And I guess they did announce today they're going to do some mini ETF. It's kind of like Berkshire B shares or something where they're going to convert it to a, a lower fee. So that was nice of them finally to do that. I'm not, yeah, it says, Baltrun has tweeted, it's a mini me low fee version of GBTC, which investors in GBTC will be able to get into without a tax hit via a special dividend. That's cool. That's that's uh, good for them. Good for them. Yes. They were catching At a lot least- of shrapnel. Uh, yes. for keeping the fee side, but uh, uh, that's cool. Um, Will Clemente tweeted, Bitcoin ETF inflows have absolutely blown golds out of the water. Not even close. Uh, looking at GLD flows, inflation adjusted. And yeah, these charts are not even remotely the same thing. Balchuna says, first two months officially in the books. And the 10 Bitcoin ETFs now have over $55 billion in assets with exactly double that in volume. If these were the numbers at the end of the year, I'd call them a success. To do it in eight weeks is simply absurd. So, yeah, IBID and FBTC um, are doing as much, not not doing as much, but they're on the same chart as VLO, IVV, and VTI. So People complained forever that they weren't, the SEC wasn't allowing a Bitcoin ETF, and it was a problem. You could argue the timing of this actually worked out perfectly for crypto, because it's a little, it's kind of far away from the F, F, SBF stuff, and there wasn't anything else really going on in this space that this happening was perfect timing for the yeah, crypto industry. I hadn't considered that. That's a good point. Uh, all right, lastly, I, I, don't, I don't know what's going on here. So Michael Saylor um, tweeted, MicroStrategy has acquired an additional 12,000 BTC 
for $821 million using proceeds from convertible notes and excess cash for $68,000. They hold $6.9 billion worth of Bitcoin at an average price of $33,000 a coin. So I was like reading up on this and I'm thinking to myself, who's buying these convertible notes? Who's giving them this money? I don't under, I, I genuinely good, don't that's understand. That's a good that. question. It's paying 0.62% a year. And I think there's like a 40 something percent premium in the stock price that maybe you can convert it and get that spread. I'm not exactly sure who the buyers of these things are, but I'm assuming they're not complete idiots, right? Like I assume they know a lot more about this than I do. But then Sam Lee quote tweeted and said, Saylor spent $820 million to buy Bitcoin last night. MicroStrategy's market cap is up $2.4 billion as a result. He's turned MicroStrategy into a perpetual short squeeze machine that converts losses from short sellers into BTC. So convertible note, buy Bitcoin, add four times in that uh, to your market cap, and he's just he just keeps doing it. Over the last year, MicroStrategy is up 680% and Bitcoin's up 250%. It's now, a levered bet. It's a, fell, it fell more, but it's a levered bet on Bitcoin. It's a levered bet on Bitcoin. Um, so... Again, I don't know enough about the mechanics, so I'd love for somebody to explain to me what's going on here, but it seems pretty, uh, I don't know if genius is the right word, but uh, whatever he's doing, it's working. you look at the, the chart working. of this of this stock, just straight vertical the last, it's it's pretty crazy. Yeah. The last year or so. Uh, anyway. Can we talk about some good news in the housing market? Please. I've been trying to do this more. So this is from the, Wall, the Washington Post. Less money, less house, how market forces are reshaping the American home. And they have this chart in here that shows new homes are gradually getting smaller. So the median square foot topped out at like 2,500 in 2015, and it's now fallen to less than 2,200, which is kind of where it was in the early 2000s. And they say, D.R. Horton, the country's largest home buyer, sold more than 82,000 homes last year, most of them under $400,000 into first-time home buyers. Its lineup now starts at 900 square feet. These are those smaller homes we were talking about. Even Toll Brothers, which is known for its high-end properties, with average sales of prices of a million dollars, are downsizing to lower price options. S sales under $400,000 more than doubled the past year, outperformed more expensive properties. Do you think so that's think, a sweet spot for housing size? I don't know. I mean, I think the reason this is happening is just because people, it's it's cheaper. And they're realizing, like, there's a market for this. We talked last week that 30, what is it, 31 and 32-year-olds are the most, are the biggest age cohorts in the country. Like they're they're meeting demand where it is. It makes sense. Mm. So this is actually a pretty good sign, right? I think so. Here's the bad sign. This is from Freddie Mac. A lot of people have thought, and I've talked about this too, like the 2030s, the boomers are going to start dying off. It's morbid, death and taxes, you know, whatever. So Freddie Mac decided to look into this. And so they said, as of 2022, there's 69,000 baby boomers. Credit to you for not making 69 jokes anymore. You've matured a lot, <laughs> you know? It used to be every time you would you would do one and you'd say nice. So I'm, I appreciate you not doing it anymore. Being a father has just made you more mature, hasn't it's it? A, it's a year of maturity. All right. So baby boomers account for 21% of the population, but 38% of total homeowners. And so the point is these boomers are holding on to their houses. They need to sell them. But they show that the boomer households is going to go from 32 million in 2022 to 23 million by 2035. So 9.2 million fewer boomer households, but it's going to be like a slow trickle for that to happen. And it's going to be, it's like less than 1% of owner-occupied homes are going to be hitting the market in the 2030s. It's not, it's not going to be a big amount. It's going to be a, it's not going to be like a tsunami of boomer houses hitting the market. And Logan Motoshami made a good point about this, that the... Remember all the crazy old folks' homes stories from the pandemic of just COVID ripping through? And Logan was saying that like that, people seeing that may have caused like how many boomers are going to want to go to a retirement home? Like when they, when, like are they actually going to want to give up their house? Or are they going to say, no, I'm going to spend a little more money and have home care here or something? Unless yeah, they mean, have the AI robots to take care of them then, I don't I know. I think most people are going to choose rich. <laughs> uh, have you seen that guy yes hilarious right the the weird thing about the internet that would be hard to explain to someone in the past is you can't really there's a gray area between someone who is playing up a part and being themselves as a douchebag or just being a douchebag and you can't tell that the line is blurred 
where someone is doing a bit versus they are this person, they're acting, you so, can't tell anymore. So for people that are unaware of this bit that we're talking about, there's a crypto bro who is going on these wild rants and then he's ending it with choose rich. So I'm not sure. I don't, I don't follow this guy closely. I don't know if this started out as like mildly serious and then turned into a complete joke. Like obviously at this point he's joking, right? This is, it, it sort of looks like an SNL skit at this point. Uh, and he's hilarious, but I also don't want to give him too much credit because if this started out real and then he discovered that people, th and then he pivoted to like, oh, I'm just going to be in on the joke. It's like the the meme from, uh, what's that show on Amazon with the superheroes, the boys, where the guy's like, eh, you know, it kind of comes around. It's that. <laughs> yeah. But and either way, to it. but either yeah. way uh, credit to this guy. He's producing internet gold. All right. Uh, New York Times had a story. A bunch of people sent me this because it was the best spot for first-time homebuyers. A lot of first-time homebuyer talk here. Number seven on the list, Grand Rapids, Michigan. And they, they talked about this from uh, affordability, employment opportunities, commute times, and local culture and entertainment options. Okay, Grand Rapids, Michigan, number seven on this list. What do you guys have that culturally that's good for young people? Well, they just named Grand Rapids for, I think, the seventh year in a row, Beer City, USA. Okay. We have tons of breweries. A lot of the brewery scene really, you know, founders and bells. It actually, a lot of it started in West Michigan. Hmm. Uh, there's there's concert venues now. There's lots of good restaurants. The changes in Grand Rapids downtown from now and 20 years ago is night and day. Are there, there cultural, used to be literally nothing to do. Are there cultural differences between East and West Michigan? Yes, definitely. It's, it's, yeah, but, but don't you think if you go to a city these days, so many cities look the same. They all have the similar looking restaurants and breweries. And if you travel around, it used to be like, you know, you'd get different things in different cities. Now, most mid sized cities kind of all have, have it figured out. Like, we have to have a good little downtown area. We have to have the you coffee have to have shops like a, and the bar. Like a, a, a restaurant with like exposed brick. Yes, they, they all kind of have figured yeah, that out. Yeah. And if there's a river or a body of water, you build around it. So yeah. they've all kind of it's they're all kind of similar now. It's which is a, a good thing. But I look, I pulled this up in Grand Rapids City proper. I, I looked for, you know, houses under, I think I did three hundred thousand. And there was I put the map in here. There was a ton of them. I found one of these little mini ones, right? Remember we said? Oh uh huh. So this one is actually thirteen hundred square feet for 180,000 in Grand Rapids City proper. The the it's it's gotten way more expensive in the suburbs and stuff. But in the city, like there's still relatively affordable housing. All right, so two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars for a three-bedroom, one-bath house with thirteen hundred forty-four square feet. That doesn't sound like a bad deal. That's like a, that's a large apartment, really large. Yeah, apartment. I, I looked at that. It lo it's like this brand new renovation. There, there was some. It's I, I was surprised. There was more supply than I would have thought. Hmm. All right, here's something that's never happening again. I think this is from. Bloomberg, non-mortgage interest payments climbed to an annual rate of $573 billion in January. It's the highest on record, even after adjusting for inflation, and within a hair's breadth of the annual mortgage interest. So interest paid on everything else, credit cards and car loans and all this stuff, and personal loans, is about as high as mortgage interest payments, which is, it's never been close, because mortgages make up 70% of the debt in this country. Wow. This See, is just never and, happening again, right? And what, what is this, credit cards for the most part? It's got to be. I, I'm guessing auto loans is a big part of it too, because auto loans are bigger and student yeah, loans. Yeah, I mean, this is this is definitely this is definitely weighing on people. But this is the this is the bifurcation of the United States. If you own a home with a three percent mortgage and you pay your credit card debt every month, higher rates have not impacted you very much. Not even a, not even a little. If you don't own a home and you carry credit card debt and you buy a new car, you are saying this is. Weimar Germany. Yeah, I, I I hate talking about things in terms of us versus them, but that's really what happened here. Yes, there's a, and this is especially why I say young people have the biggest gripe against the economy right now. If they yeah. didn't buy a home, yeah. they they have a gripe. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so so it's from the effective mortgage rate is still below four percent. Like that's if you averaged everyone up, even with a seven percent mortgage, and credit cards are much higher. Um, but. Interest payments as a share of U.S. household income is still very low, way lower than the 70s and 80s, way lower than the 2000s. It's going up, but it's still much lower. I got a question for you. These, wait, John, maybe you can tell us since you're a car guy too. How big of a D-bag do you have to be to say Porsche as opposed to Porsche? Like, do you have to watch F1 every morning on the Saturdays? <laughs> what do you think? Would, would Duncan say Porsche or Porsche? I think Porsche? Duncan does say Porsche. Okay. I mean, I see, it's I can technically see Duncan... the guy's name, so you don't say like Ferrari. You say the full name, Ferrari. Uh, right. But yes, I, I see where you're coming from. I go fifty fifty between them. No, okay, if you so if you're if you're a if you're a race car fan, fine. That's it. 
I think that's, yeah, if you have an F1 hat like Duncan, you have to, so the reason I say this is because these Porsche Cayennes are the, the, they're smaller SUVs. It's one of those things where if you see one, you see them everywhere. And so I've been what's seeing the them all over the What's the bigger one called? Oh, I didn't know there was a bigger one. I but, actually think the Cayenne might be the bigger one. Okay. So I see them and it looks kind of like one of the Audi Q, whatever, Q5, 6, 7, no, whatever. They, it looks kind of like an Audi, I think. But I see them all over the place now, and I'm thinking, geez, how expensive are these that so many people are driving a Porsche around? And it says they start at 79000 So I'm guessing you add a bunch of bells They're and 90. whistles. The average cost is probably, what, 90? 90, yeah. I, I, I'm just surprised that I see so many of them. Do you think it's because people just, just it's a brand thing? Like, I can say I drive a Porsche if I drive one of these things. Uh, is it a brand thing? Yeah, what else would it be? I, I don't know. It's just, I'm surprised how many of them I see. And here's a further question. So we're talking about inflation. If you drive a Porsche, can you complain about higher prices? Even Defin if it's a Cayenne and not a regular Porsche. Definitely not. Okay. Did you see the curb with Lori Laughlin driving a Porsche away? That was a sweet Porsche. Yeah. I By just, the way. That was, that was pretty great that they brought her on for that. Two things on this. Uh, my seven-year-old Kobe had a curb your enthusiasm moment. Okay. So he, like I, has spilkus. And is not the best behaved in school. He's not bad. He's not mean. He's not like punching kids, but he's silly. He's chatty. He doesn't raise can't his sit. hand. That's that's my son. He can't sit still. Yeah. All things that uh, uh, impacted me when I was his age. So we get a report every day, like a smiley chart uh, to monitor his behavior. And yesterday he was so proud that he got all smileys for the first time and not even like a chatty at lunch, chatty at reading time, like no, nothing bad. It was just all smiles. And I said, Kobe, I'm so proud of you. I'm going to give you a pack of cards. Uh, I'm going to give you a vision pro. Exactly. In, in fact, it wasn't a pack of cards. It was like a sticker book, a sticker book of cards. So anyway, uh, later in the day, Robin asked about his teacher and Kobe goes, she wasn't in school today. We, we had a, we had a sub, we had a substitute <laughs> oh. teacher. <laughs> and I'm like, that's why you got all smileys. So she, she gave everyone a smiley face then. <laughs> <laughs> everyone got smileys. He got graded on the curve. My son had to, so they all have their ch little chairs and he would lean back so often in his chair, it's got four legs, he kept falling over and he did it all day. And my wife works in the school, walked by one day and saw he was literally on like his own special chair that had no legs. It was just a little spinny chair. And he's the only one in the class who's sitting on a special chair because he couldn't sit still. So I'm not I'm not going to complain about the situation with my wife's car um, because nobody, it's really lame when people are in a position of, to broadcast stuff. And they, like when people complain about like airlines and stuff, it's like really, yes. nobody cares. They're looking for a handout or something, right? But I just will say this, I'm not going to tell the full story and smear them through the mud, which they deserve. I'm not going to do that. Oh, that's right. You sent me the email the other day. <laughs> truly unbelievable. <laughs> but here's the thing. So I said to Robin, we will never buy a German car ever again. Now, when you buy it versus lease, those are two totally different things, but I don't even want to lease this car again. And she's fighting with me. She's like, but I love my car. It's, it's not, it's not corporate. It's a dealership. I'm like, it's both. They both stink. So she, what do I do? She really wants to lease another. I said, get a, let's get a Kia Telluride. Great car. Let's get a Toyota, whatever. Get a Cayenne. No, no, well, that's not happening. All right. Uh, so my wife and I got married in 2007, and this morning I went to iron my shirt, got it look crisp for the podcast, and uh, iron died, and we got our iron as a wedding present. So almost 17 years that thing lasted. I wanted to buy the same one again. It doesn't even exist anymore. Who made it? I was like, Shark. They're the ones who make like the vacuums and stuff. Do you iron your shirts every day? Depends how wrinkly it is. When's the last time you used an iron? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just going to guess. It's been a while. No, every time. No, no, no. Every time I go, every time I stay in a hotel and I have a button up. By the way, you'd be proud okay. of me. Last week, I don't know if you saw the pictures of me on TCAF. I was wearing like slacks and a button up. And everyone was like, why are you dressed up so nice today? I was like, what? I can't yeah. dress nice in the office. Everybody, like 10 times. I'm like, all right, here's the, here's the, here's the truth. I have two pairs of jeans. And they were both dirty. <laughs> <laughs> so so you know like what, dressing. You know what I did this weekend? I went to Nordstrom. I got five pairs of pants. So now I'm, I, I should be good for the next decade. So you went to the mall? I went to the mall. Did you spend like $400 on a pair again? Jeans are really expensive. Uh, I got 
two pairs that were $200 each and two pairs that were $130 each and one pair that was, I can't remember. Is that too much? I don't know. For me, that's, I only buy clothes that are on sale pretty much. Yeah, but I don't buy clothes. Places- I don't buy clothes. And guess what? If I'm doing the math, these things are, these things will last me, honestly, four years. So it'll, it'll probably be uh, $2 or wear. See, I have way more clothes than you, I think, though. Right. I probably have 20 pairs of jeans. Okay, well, if I had so 20 pairs of jeans, I probably ridiculous would. ridiculous pair, yes. Uh, anyway. Uh, all right, can I read an email that we got? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a bit long, but I thought it was so nice. I wanted to share. Oh, and it's from a British person, or right? There's a, there's a you in the favorite. It's got to be. Gentlemen, apologies, as this may be a bit long. Your podcast is my favorite by a long shot. I haven't missed a single Wednesday show since inception. I started working and investing in 2017, and in the years since, your guidance has helped me put my financially put my financial feet solidly on the ground. Without your wisdom, I think the ups and downs of the market through COVID would have done me in. In 2020 through 2022 was very uh, 2020 through 2022 was very hard for me. I had career troubles, felt bad about my finances, and was lost in many ways. Listening to you guys regularly was a bright spot and helped me feel so much better about my life. I cannot thank you enough. Listening to you both is like being in a room with my friends. Your chemistry is so obvious and immersive. I regularly find myself laughing, nodding along, and finishing half of your jokes because you guys do such a good job building rapport with the audience. The fact that you can make anyone feel positive and educate them at the same time is a testament to your incredible talents as both financial professionals and human beings. Michael, your introduction for Eli was moving. I had difficulties at various times in my young life, and hearing that come to the surface for you was cathartic for me. I felt like I was there with you on that emotional journey. The way you talk about Kobe, Robin, and the rest of your family is chef's kiss. Today's comment about returning to AVP because of Kobe. Wow, I think you already... All right, uh, this is getting too much. Um, uh, Ben, on to you. Ben, you are one of the most measured podcast hosts out there. I agree with like 90% of your takes and the advice you give on animal spirits and ATC is so balanced and well thought out. Investing is a journey and you have helped me understand my risk tolerance better than anyone else. Your emphasis on planning and talk and thinking about the long run is so helpful. Your ability to remain focused on the long-term data and realities of the market is what carried me through the lows of 2022. Not only in terms of investments, because I applied that same rationale to my career, and it has turned out better than I could have imagined. You even turned me on to the Miami Vice in Florida. Uh, and now it's the best beach drink I ever had. Oh, Toronto. It was President Toronto. Darn straight. Uh, that was very nice. How, how nice was that? And I will say, boost. we actually got like two or three that were very similar to this this week. And I don't think we talk about the audience enough or thank the audience enough, but we're, I, I don't know about Ben. I don't take you guys for granted. Maybe Ben does. I don't. <laughs> I know... That, hey, I'm the one in the comment section every week. <laughs> I know that podcasting, not podcasting, your time is a is a finite resource. And the fact that so many people choose rich with animal spirits, uh, whatever, on, on Wednesday morning is part of your routine, it means so much to us. So thank you. Yeah, we appreciate it. One more. Last week, a bunch of people wrote about the wait times at restaurants. And a lot of people said, yes, I used to work at a restaurant. We make it up, but we always go higher so the person feels better psychologically. That makes sense to me. That does make sense. So oh, we say 40 minutes when we know it's going to be 20. You know, I don't know if this is an anecdote or what. Uh, is there, is Benny Hanna national? I don't, not sure. It's yes. A, yeah. Okay. International. International. I so, ate it one in Aruba once, which is pretty bad. Okay. So I, I have, I have never vacation been. And go to Benny Hanna. I've never been to a Benny Hanna. I've had hibachi, but I've never been to a Benny Hanna. The, and the wait time was, we got there, it was, we had reservations for, it was Robin and the kids and another family and their kids. We got there at 7.30, reservation. I don't think we sat till like 8.10. It was kind of weird. It was packed. Um, so when we were on the way there, I said to Kobe, I've never had Benihana. He's been there before with his friends. And he goes, oh, you're going to love hibachi. <laughs> it was very cute. <laughs> kids love that kind of stuff, right? It's fun. They throw the, sh- yeah, throw yeah, the shrimp yeah. up in their it's mouth fun. or whatever, yeah. Uh, right, did you watch the Oscars? I did watch some of the Oscars. Did we talk about the Pacino thing? No, but it was a uh, boy. He sure mailed it in, huh? <laughs> it was so weird. <laughs> he he walked out on stage. Now listen, he's an old, he's a legitimately old man, but he he walked out on stage. It was like he had a dinner reservation. He looked at the envelope and said, "I see Oppenheimer." N- no, no, uh, and here are the nominees. Nothing. Just uh, Oppenheimer. That's just uh, I've lived a long time. I. Uh... I think this happens in old. We always laughed. My grandma, when she got old, we were at a restaurant one time and my wife, who I think she was my girlfriend at the time, her fiance, and she wasn't paying attention. And my grandma just kind of clapped at her like, hey, get your order in. Like, I think when you're old, you just, you do what you want. Don't you think? That's like- Clearly. Yeah. All right. So speaking of the Oscars, I tried to watch because Emma Stone, I'm a big Emma Stone fan. I always liked her. 
from super bad on i she's been great so she won the best actress nominee for poor things and so i'd never really heard of it but i i, I she was on smart list and she talked about it and it's by it's a film not a movie and you you said before like ben you're a film guy like there's no way i'm a total film guy because this movie it's on hulu you're you're a film guy i saw the trailer and i'm i'm i'm, I'm so out on this I'm sure if you went to film school, you'd go, oh, the angles of this in the, but I've never taken meth before, but I imagine that taking meth feels like this movie. It's just. Did you enjoy it? No, I turned it off for 20 minutes. It's, okay. it's I, again, I, you could, if you're a film person, you could say, oh, I appreciate the, they went for it here, but it's just, it's so bizarre. It too much for me. Yeah, New no show. Interest. I think someone might've, sometimes it's hard for me to tell where I get my recommendations from. I think this is from a bunch of people in the show, in a, in our email, Drops of God is a show on Apple. It takes place between France and Tokyo. So there's some, there are some, and so it's English, French, and Japanese that people are speaking. So there are some subtitles if you're against that thing. I don't mind it because I know how to read. Uh, <laughs> no, not to brag. It's a show about, I'll give, because it's in the IMDb description. Uh, this woman's father dies and he has the, mo he has the most expensive wine uh, wine cellar in the in the world or like $150 million and it's his daughter and his protege for wine tasting have like a wine taste off for who gets his collection. That's the premise. And it's really good and it's it's a little bit pretentious wine stuff but it's it's I, I'm kind of blown away how good this show is. I've never heard anyone talk about it before. Hmm. I never heard of it. One more. Colin Farrell's best performance ever. You've seen in Bruges before? Of course. I, I watched again for the fourth time probably. It's good. Him as the dim-witted I love that movie. He's Very good. so, so good. All right. Very good. That's it. Um, again, Ben, credit to you for putting me on to um, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Pretty good, right? Blown away. I can't believe the quality of it. They have to have another season, I hope, right? I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I'm just I, saying with it, with, I think they could be different spies, but the, the one with the neighbors where they have dinner and they, they still kind of oh, kept you in the yeah. dark about what was really going on. Very if they, good show. If they do another one, if they do another one, it should be a different couple. I don't need to spend any more time with them, even though I thought it was great. I just I thought one season was was good enough. Yes, I, I'd, I'd like to see a different couple. Uh, okay, because I want to learn more about the the organization. They didn't tell us enough. Yeah, true. So Ricky Stanicki, did you watch it? I did. We both we texted about this, and it it went straight to Amazon. It's the kind of movie that should go straight to Amazon. It's a raunchy comedy, which we don't get a lot of anymore, and it was the dumbest plot ever, but it made me laugh a lot. It made me John laugh John Cena lot. is legitimately a funny comedic actor. I can't believe it. Yeah. Yeah. John Cena. I mean, what he, he showed off at, at the Oscars. He's, he's talented. I mean, beyond talented. He's, he, he, he carries he plays that. He plays basically that same character in Vacation Friends, which is two movies on Hulu. And Ricky Snicky is better than those movies, but he's funny in those too. I actually, I kind of like him. So this movie was directed by Peter Farrelly. Did you know that? I didn't know that until you told me, and it, it makes oh, sense I told you? thinking okay. about it. So anyway, so I, I was looking at Peter Farrelly's IMDb. I didn't realize he directed Green Book. I thought he was a comedy guy only. Remember Green Book? <laughs> I didn't know that either. So he's also done, and how did I not know that he did Hall Pass? <sighs> that, that makes sense. That makes sense, they're, right? They, they do have their, yeah. So he did it without his brother then. He also did uh, Shallow Hal, Me, Myself, and Irene. There's something about Mary. He did that with his brother, Kingpin, Dumb Remember, and Dumber. A couple weeks ago, I told you Shallow Hal, they should do a new one. I love Shallow where women, Hal. Where women get hypnotized into thinking men like you have hair. That should be the <laughs> new Shallow Hal. <laughs> All right, that's a, good, that's, a, that's a good place to wrap. Animal Spirits at thecompoundnews.com. Personal emails, keep them coming. Personal responses. Thank you very much for listening. We'll see you next time. <laughs>